Okay, let's take a look now at the third stanza. So what does Wordsworth tell us in here? All right, this is not a vain belief, All right? This is, this is real. He's experienced this moment, this essence of sublimity, more than once he has turned back to this moment many times, right? During this five years, he's remembered this moment many times, had the same transcendental experience encountering the sublime. Now, fourth stanza, let's see what happens. And now with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. He kind of snaps out of this, you know, this passaging through time, and then he comes back. While here I stand, right? So now he's back. Boom, we're back. 1798. Not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment, this moment, there is life and food for future years, right? So Wordsworth has come back to the present, he's, this swimming through time is done, and he realizes now that in the future, right, that what will he have? He'll be able to do what he's doing now in the future to this moment. And what is he doing now? He's reflecting on and experiencing transcendence to when he was here the first time. So what, what's happening here is that time is becoming fluid. He's not trapped like we are in moving through time sequentially. He's able to just move through all however he wants to into all of these different transcendent moments. And then Wordsworth starts thinking about nature, right? With the capital N. What was like nature? What was Wordsworth, what was, I'm sorry, what was nature like for Wordsworth, got it, when he was young, when he was before, right? He loved the physical pleasures of nature. In other words, he loved running through the fields, climbing up trees like we all did when, when we were young, right? The, the physical loves of nature, right? So what does Wordsworth say? I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy woods, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite of feeling and a love that had no need of a remote, remoter charm by thought supplied or any interest unborrowed from the eye. So that, that physical, that sensual experience that he had with nature before as a boy, what about it? That time is past. Oof. So what he was looking back when he was a child, right? That childhood experience of nature is gone. He's experiencing a loss. Not, woo, he say not, what are you doing? Taken, right, so now, right? He's realizing as an adult, right, reflecting back upon nature, what it was like as a child, very sensual, running about, afraid of things, gloomy woods, you know, afraid of the dark in the woods. That is gone, right? He, as an adult, he's able to re reflect back and realize that, but, not for this faint eye, nor mourn, nor murmur. He's, he's really not upset about this because what has happened as an adult is that he's had a consolation, loss and consolation, right? A, a good way to think about this is as we age, right, we achieve maturity, different visions, and then we kind of realize that the way that we looked at life before, eh, it's gone. We, we can't look at, go through life looking at things as a child. There's a consolation. Other gifts, ooh, gifts again, have followed. For such loss, I believe abundant recompense. 
For I have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth. So he's realized that this time before was thoughtless. But hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence. Ooh, a presence. A quiet hand on the shoulder that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts. So what is the consolation? It's a presence. It's a joy of elevated thoughts. A sense what? Sublime. There that word is again. A sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of setting suns. Ooh, what is this presence? Where does it live? In the light of setting suns, the round ocean, the living air, the blue sky, and in the mind of man. Right? This presence is found not only in nature, the supernatural presence. If you think it's not supernatural, you're, we're, we're missing the whole point here, right? So the supernatural presence, where is it? In the light of sinning suns, it's in the ocean, it's in the air, and in the mind of man. Emotion and what? A spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains of all that we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they have create and what perceive. Well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor. What does an anchor do? It keeps you from being blown away during a storm. The anchor of my purest thoughts the nurse. What does a nurse do? When you're sick, a nurse comes to you, cares for you, watches over you as you heal and recover, become better. The guide. What does a guide do? Keeps you on your way. A guardian. What does a guardian do? Watches over you, right? Like a guardian angel, but it's not guardian angel. This is this presence. What is this presence? This is the transcendental presence that Wordsworth is experiencing because of the sublime. What is it? Anchor, nurse, guide, guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. This is the consolation, this is the realization that Wordsworth has had from nature. Nature is becoming a spiritual power for Wordsworth. 